welcome to Build. We are coming to you live from London, and today we are joined by the Husky Voice model who won our hearts when he came to Camilla's rescue on Love Island this summer. He's no Mel. Please give it up for Jamie Jewett. It's a very warm welcome, Jamie. That is a very warm welcome. <laughs> How are you? You good? Uh, very good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, Pretty good, tired. good. It's all been a bit crazy, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Hanging in there. Good. Uh, now, before we get started, if you guys have got a question for Jamie, uh, you can tweet us at Series, B, B, uh, at series build, build Series London. There we go. Uh, or you can leave a question in the Facebook comments too. Um, so, Jamie, uh, we're going to chat loads about Love Island later on, awesome. uh, as I'm sure you're looking forward to. But I know the past sort of three months have been a bit of a whirlwind for you, right? Yeah, they have. Yeah, it's been um, it's been mad. Yeah, just trying to sort of organise myself and figure out what to do and what not to do. And <laughs> Where to go and where, where not to go. <laughs> so I know one of the things that you're really excited about and um, that you've got coming up later this month actually is your TEDx talk Control Alt Delete. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that sort of came about? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm excited about it. It's going to be cool. It's like nothing I've ever done before. Um, it basically came about. We just got an email about from Ted asking if I'd have anything to say. Like Control Alt Delete is like the umbrella of the whole of the whole uh, day. So everybody has to. Sort of do a talk around that same subject, and uh, they said, given my modelling history and the influences maybe the digital world could have had on that, would I have something to say on it? So I thought I did. So, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, I took it on. Because as you mentioned, it's on the subject of sort of digital detox and sort of the influence that the digital world has on sort of our mental health and stuff. Why do you think that's such an important issue for people these days? Because you hear more and more about people needing to switch off from the world, don't you? Yeah, I mean, like I say, that was my take on Control Alt Delete. That was the, the thing I wanted to talk about because myself, I, have, I wasn't exactly uh, the biggest fan of Instagram and social media when it first came out. Um, I like it now. <laughs> <laughs> I I like You've got it. a lot of followers on there now yeah, as well. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I found it quite interesting. Obviously, when they first asked me to do that talk, um, I, I, would, I, I knew I'd wanted to do it on mental health and self-esteem, and I sort of tied that into social media. My view on that is... Um, I, I find it can be it, it can be quite harsh on kids. I find the model industry as well, from the way we sort of post things that are so altered and so edited, um, it can sort of give off the sort of wrong image mm. um, to people that see them. And and, and yeah, I, I I thought I'd talk about it from that angle and and what to look out for and more to stop praising people on their looks, praise people for what they do um, outside of that. So yeah. Kind of, yeah, I, I read somewhere that you said that um, actually unplugging from, from that world actually helped you with your own mental health as well, right? Yeah, that was going to be sort of the end of the talk. Um, Spo spoiler, I've given away the ending. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Uh, yeah, basically I found it quite interesting. I was quite, well, I was pretty depressed before I went into Love Island. Um, and I found it quite fascinating because when I sort of got asked to do the show, I was very unsure about going in there and obviously it's a very social thing and I mm. knew it wasn't in the best mind space myself. Um, but going in there, they take your phone off you, you're not allowed television, music, literally nothing. Um, all you can do is wake up in the morning, have your relationships with each other, have chats and build strong bonds. And after two or three days in there, I felt like I completely got my head back and it was... It, it sort of goes, it showed me that a lot of the problems I had was the disconnect or the worry or the I say the disconnect but you're connected to something that's not quite real you're connected to your phone yeah it's a very odd environment to be it in it is yeah and i find people focus too much on things that are happening that aren't in front of them um you see so many people this is where my my angle came from for the ted talk it's like y you have billions of people at the touch of a button to judge yourself against as opposed to back in the day when you would sort of mm. just have your friends, your family, and the people you interact with, we're competitive, we're competitive beings, <laughs> I see. Do you know yeah. what I mean? We are, naturally. Um, but I find nowadays it's unnatural for kids to see so much competition and see so many people, and a lot of these lives that they see are caricatures of the real lives that these people lead. They're not really real. They, You know, you look on Instagram and you see, like, <laughs> a, a pumped-up version or a, or a you know, rose-tinted glass version of, of, of somebody's life. Mm. You sort of advertise yourself on there not in the most genuine way, so I find it's quite unhealthy. 
But it's also really refreshing as well for someone like you to be speaking out about stuff like this because we've had we've had it with um, some of your Love Island co-stars this week, Chris and Cam, have both sort of spoken out on the topic of mental health. So it's really sort of nice that young guys there seems to be a real focus on men's mental health at the moment. So I always think it's really refreshing and brave when people speak out like that. Yeah, I think it's just testament for the fact that how common it is. Um, I know, you know, I'm glad the other boys have, have been talking about it, and it just goes, I know, I know speaking to Chris, I remember him saying a lot about his past and stuff, and I think it just goes to show that there's so many people out there that it has affected and that it does affect, and uh, with men, I find the difference is it's very hard for guys to talk about mm. it. So all of a sudden, when something like Mental Health Day comes up or Mental Health Awareness Week, all of a sudden, all of these people just come, you know, right to the surface, and it just sort of everybody has some sort of experience with it, whether it be someone they know or themselves. And it just, you know, I think it just goes, it needs to, something needs to be done about it. People do need to talk about it. And I'm glad, I'm glad um, everybody does. You know, it's becoming more acceptable now. Is that kind of what inspires you to sort of speak out yourself? I always was going to. It was kind of a plan of mine before I went in. It was what I wanted to do mm. before I went into Love Island. I didn't plan on going into Love Island. It was like a two-day. <laughs> I got a phone call out the blue. I hadn't applied for it. It just literally came out of the blue for me. So it's quite a hard decision for me to make. Um, but that being said, that is why I sort of came out with my plans pretty set in place. And that's why I've sort of avoided the usual things that I would was expected to do when I came out. Because I had a you know, I had a sort of plan in place to do to do these talks to to help out on this subject and other subjects. So yeah, I'm glad it gave me the platform to do so. so. Yeah, we are too. How have you found sort of <laughs> plugging back into the into the real world? Is that been a weird sort of because it's kind of not the real world that you left behind before you went into Love Island? Exactly what I was about to say. It's not really the real world anymore. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's been good. It's been good. It's been weird. It's really really nice. Obviously, people knowing you on the street and come, people come and say hello and it's. Everyone's really friendly, so that's all a bit of a buzz. Um, but other than that, yeah, like I say, it's it's sort of just managing myself and figuring out what to do. It can be quite stressful because mm. obviously you get bombarded with offers for all sorts of different things, and it's just um, and then there's that thing in your head where you're like, oh, you got to jump on this while you can, kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it's just um, a little bit of stress mixed in with a lot of excitement, and uh, yeah, I'm still buzzing. So. Um, since leaving Love Island, you've also been pouring your efforts into charity work as well, um, which was something we saw you discuss with Camilla on the show. Mm. Um, you recently visited Greece um, to some of the refugee camps there, right? Yeah. How did that all kind of come about? Was that sort of facilitated through Camilla, through the show? Yeah. Um, no, that was, just, that was just me and Camilla. We would spoke about it when we were in there. And it's weird because obviously on that show you only see an hour of 24, so it's very hard to see mm. what we talk about most of the time. And half the stuff me and Cam would waffle on about for hours, I don't think would make very good TV. <laughs> <either. So laughs> um, but yeah, it came to the point we got out, and I think we were both sort of the same as everybody else, inundated with offers to do different things and sort of pulled in one direction, pushed in another. Mm. We just decided, we had the plan to go on the trip, we didn't plan on going it that early. But um, yeah, so we just thought, you know what, should we just get out of here now and do it? And she obviously used her contacts because she's, you know, lived and done charity, lived and breathed it for the last four or five, six years of her life. Um, so we used her contacts, went out there, and it was amazing. Best trip I've ever done. So what, what was the sort of the reality of it when you got there? Was it what you were expecting? Um, no. Yes and no, I guess. It's, um, it w it, I wasn't expecting to, it to affect me as much as it did, mm. but I think that always happens. They have a saying in the volunteer world that if you have, get a volunteer for a day, you'll have a volunteer for life. And um, and I get why that is because once you go to a place like that and see, the f you know, meet the people, see see the conditions they live in, and also see the kind of people they are, like some of the nicest people I've ever met, when they have next to nothing or or nothing, have lost everything, and it baffles me that we come back into this world, our really privileged world, and we see people that are stressed and depressed, mm. left, right, and centre. So I think we're missing the mark a little bit somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that being said, it it, it was. It was shocking to see, but it was also, in a weird roundabout way, it was a pleasant, you know, it was a pleasant trip. What kind of work was it that you guys were doing over there? Basically, we went, it was northern Greece, Thessaloniki, I don't know if I said that already, but um, <laughs> yeah, we went to four different refugee camps with four different organisations, and they're all grassroots organisations that were funded under the umbrella of Help Refugees, which is somebody that Cam knew who started an organisation to raise funding, and it blew up. 
um, and now they fund grassroots organisations all over the world. And basically what these grassroots organisations do, they take all of their time out and they've dedicated their lives to going to, there's only five or six involved in each one sometimes, they're that small, and they just spend their whole time out there building things, setting up things for the, for the refugees to do, like libraries, like places for the kids to play, just things as small as that, like guitar lessons, like all these sorts of things. Um, so yeah, it was just amazing to see what these people do, how much time and effort they put mm. in, how much dedication it takes, and uh, I think they've, uh, I think it's all for the, all for the refugees. It's all. Now, I also read that you actually filmed part of your trip um, to make a documentary. Is that right? Yeah, it is. It's quite frustrating because I, I remember I came back. I'm like, right, I'm going to have this edited in a week. <laughs> I literally have not touched it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I used to direct about two, three years ago. Um, when I was living in New York, I used to shoot fashion videos and stuff. So um, I had all the camera equipment. I've always wanted to use it again, but I had nothing to use it for. And it was sitting in the corner of my room. And then when we booked this trip, I was like, this is the perfect opportunity. So I took it all with me and filmed the whole thing. Um, and I'm going to make probably a five to 10 minute doc, um, raising awareness and hopefully something to raise funding as well as in, in, you know, influence people to, to, to volunteer if they would like. Um, please don't ask when that will be done. <laughs> it'll no be pressure. Done as soon as I get a bit of time. But yeah. Is that kind of s documentary making, is that something you'd like to explore more and, and those kind of topics within it? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, originally when I directed, I wanted to do film and television um, and documentaries and obviously work in the fashion industry. That's what I ended up doing. So that's why I stopped. I didn't really want to do that side of things. But now I've got the opportunity and now I'm sort of starting to have a bit of a foothold in, in, in that, you know, I've got the platform to do it. Um, yeah, it's definitely my main interest is documentary making. So you mentioned the fashion industry there. How do those two worlds compare? Because they are kind of polar opposites of the spectrum, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, I don't want to say too much about why I sort of ended up wanting to be charitable and do these kinds of things, but a lot of it was to do with the materialism, the superficiality of my job. I had everything handed to me on a silver platter in my eyes. Being paid for the way you look, I think, was a bit ridiculous, and I didn't think I deserved it at any point. So that, you know, that combined with me reading a lot about global conflicts and, and, and politics, it just made me feel overprivileged, and that is what pushed me into it. So, mm. yeah, the lives are... The, the, the two worlds are a stark contrast, but it ended up beneficial for me to see that side of it because it really made me want to help. But you still had such a successful career as a model. There's not many people that right. can say they've modeled for <laughs> Calvin Klein underwear, is there? Nah, well, yeah, <laughs> how, no, do, how, do you, how do you become a Calvin Klein model? We can see there, modeling not underwear, sadly, but uh, that is you. Oh, God. <laughs> There's some really terrible pictures. I'm glad you got that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, it started... My mum took me up to walk-ins when I was about 15 into London. Um, it's, you know, that old chestnut when you're young, your auntie came out, you're so handsome, you should be a model. <laughs> <laughs> so my my auntie's never said that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my auntie's all wore glasses, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah, so she took me up to walk-ins. I got taken on by an agency called FM, and they told me to leave school first. So I left school, went up to them, and then that was it, pretty much. And I remember I'd done, I got booked for a Calvin Klein runway show exclusive in Milan when I was 16 or 17. And that's where I met my New York agent at that show. And then started to work with Calvin Klein. They got in contact with her, the head office in New York, and that's why I flew over there to... to uh, and it all just happened. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is why I say I felt very sort of lucky and privileged because it just... You know, I was in school at one point in Braintree and all of a sudden I was living in New York and being a little toe rag around there. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, people always assume with, especially like male models, everyone's always got the six packs and whatnot. Is body confidence something that came quite naturally to you or is it something that you, you struggled with? Um, no, I wouldn't say it came naturally. I'm, I, I was a little bit, bit chubby when I was a kid. Um, I actually got dropped by my agency for being too heavy when I, uh, that FM agency, I didn't know. Oh, they've closed down now anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was 16, I walked in and they said, you're too big, you need to lose weight. And then they dropped me at 16, so I joined a smaller agency. Like, I remember I had these little plastic pots with like, I'd put pasta and chicken and broccoli and I'd have each one, five of them for the day. And I'd like, you know, 
weigh it all out and stuff and then really got into shape and then that agency actually the one I joined my um, booker moved back to FM and they were like want to come with me and I was like no <laughs> <laughs> but eating out of Tupperware is no way to live is there <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm a terrible cook. I think that was more the problem. But <laughs> <laughs> um, now, we couldn't have you here with chatting about Love Island. It was the show that everyone was talking about this year. Mm. Um, how's Camilla? Is she well? She's fantastic. Yeah, good. She's really good. Good, good, good. Um, now, how have you guys found sort of having a relationship on the outside? Has that been quite weird for you, sort of having been on the telly, now trying to sort of forge a relationship? Um, no, it's not been weird at all, really. It's been surprisingly smooth and simple. Like it's, um, but that, that, that's what we were worried about inside. And obviously, I know the big question always was, are you guys going to go to sea together? Are you going to be exclusive towards the end of the show? And me and her just realised it was not really a sensible thing to do in our eyes. We'd known each other two and a half, three weeks. Um, and we knew outside's a different beast, so we thought we'd wait and see. But so as soon as we got out, it... So we're official now? Can we can we say that? <laughs> I ain't saying nothing. <laughs> it's just Googs. We're having a bit of fun with that because nobody knows. And we ain't going to say nothing because every time... And the first question anybody asks is that. So we're just going to... Keep like people guessing. Ask that question. Yeah, keep nice. people guessing. Uh, we've actually had a question in from Molly on Facebook who has asked, have you two been to Ibiza yet? Which I think she's referring to the fact that you... She was going to take you to Greece and you were going to take her to Ibiza, right? I really don't remember saying that like that. <laughs> <laughs> I need to watch that episode back because I swear I said it as a joke. <laughs> but um, no, we haven't. No. Damn. You I need mean, to put I'd, that I'd in. I can't wait to go back to Ibiza. I've been trying to go back there every time ever since I went when I was 16. Well, it's end of season now, so maybe next year. Yeah. We'll, <laughs> we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Uh, now, you walked into Love Island and you were kind of the knight in shining armour for Camilla, really. She'd been through a really tough couple of weeks. Um, was there a point where you sort of went in there and you, because we knew that you liked her on the outside. What was your plan to sort of, to woo her? Did you go in with sort of a, not a game plan, um, but a sort of a? No, no, I didn't. Um, again, touching on me not really wanting to go in there in the first place, I kind of was pushed in there and like a deer in the headlights and just didn't really have much thought about anything. Obviously, I knew we'd get on. I knew we'd read a lot. I knew we read the same books. I'd, I'd, I'd watched her. And me and my parents used to sit and talk about it when we was watching Love Island as well. She'd always come up and some of the stuff she said, and my mum would nudge me and be like, sounds like you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was, it was just a combination of me just going in there, just trying to be myself. But that first day when we sat down, it just kind of went... Just clicked. As, yeah, about as smoothly as it could, and it just went from there. So, yeah, no plan, it just... She kind of became the nation's sweetheart for a good sort of three, four weeks. Why do you think it was that people just fell in love with her so much? Well, the proof's in the pudding, really. <laughs> listen to her speak about anything she speaks about. She's just such a sweet girl. Um, so genuine. She's lived a life that I don't think a lot of people could ever say they've lived anything close to and kept sort of the, I don't know, one of the best moral compasses I've seen on a person. Um, and yeah, it is, it is what you see, really. It's, it's oh, that was. <laughs> <laughs> um, we saw her being um, treated pretty terribly by Johnny before you arrived. Was that kind of like quite difficult to walk in there, having seen how he'd behaved towards her? Because I don't, I don't know about you, but I find I would have found it pretty difficult to keep my tongue in my head. But <laughs> <laughs> look, um, I weren't going to judge anybody for any of their sort of doings or goings on before I got there. One thing I know is that it's not a natural environment. Um, you've got so many different pressures on you to make certain decisions. Um, and I know Johnny had those on him. At the end of the day, it's a game show. And it, the way he handled that, not great. The way he went and kissed Tyler after about 10 seconds. Yeah, not cool. Yeah, it <laughs> wasn't, the best, wasn't the best way to handle things. I'd, but the, the one thing is I'd, I'd say, I know Johnny, Camilla loves Johnny. He's a good guy. Um, I don't think he'd ever do anything like that on the outside, but in there you've got about 10 minutes to make a decision. Um, mm. So, you know, I, I don't know, I haven't got too much to say about it. But well, let's just hope <laughs> he doesn't do it to Steph Pratt, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's interesting, that one, isn't it? <laughs> see that come. 
Uh, now, were you sort of ready for the way that everyone was going to be obsessed with you guys when you came out of the show? Because as I said earlier, it was the show that everyone was watching and talking about. And suddenly, you guys were more famous than the Kardashians, like, in this country. Brilliant. <laughs> um, <laughs> y no. Well, I d obviously, I'd gone in with three weeks towards the end, so I kind of had a gauge on how big it was. Yeah. Um, but even that being said, you still can't be ready. Obviously, I know how many people were talking about it, but you still can't prepare yourself for, you know, the interaction side of things. Mm. You come out and people are stopping you everywhere. And um, but like I say, it, it's great because everybody is really, really nice, and it's had a positive impact as opposed to coming out of a show where you can be sort of hated. And it's, I think it's a bit more of an aspirational show. It's a bit nicer yeah. to watch. It's like it, it, it's. Um, it's a happy show, isn't it? So. We've even had our first engagement. Jess and Dom headed down the aisle. Were you surprised to... Because I, I, I think a few jaws dropped when that OK <laughs> magazine cover came out. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, best of luck to them. That's <laughs> brilliant. That's like... <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, like I said, I don't really know Jess and Dom. I didn't meet them in there. I met them briefly in a hotel the first day we got out. Um... But yeah, they've been through a lot, and obviously that mic rumor and that, and if they can get through that and go and get married, and you know, it's all strength to them. <laughs> Place your bets now, guys. That's all. Uh, all I'd say. <laughs> um, are you all sort of still in contact with all the other islanders? Are you on like a WhatsApp group and all catch up, or is it sort of everyone's gone off and done their own thing now? Yeah, we were on a WhatsApp group, but it, you know, it sort of just teetered out. Like everyone was talking, and then the more busy everybody got, and like obviously some of the other guys. Had crazy busy you look at mm. like amber and ken and chris and olivia so um i think the whatsapp group just sort of put, got put on the back burner um i think in a month's time two months time and everything sort of calmed down we will meet up there's absolutely no bad blood between anyone so ignore the newspapers every 10 seconds <laughs> um but yeah it um i'm still in contact I've, I've actually met mike and had a beer with mike once um Sorry, I think you mean Muggy Mike. That's the only way we refer to Mike around these parts. Muggy Mike. <laughs> yeah, like Mike who? Um, <coughs> yeah, I've had a bit of Muggy Mike. Uh, Johnny, I'd like to see. Um, Gab's a mask, I can't wait to see. But like I say, it's just been impossible. We did try and meet up two or three times, and after that, we were like, you know what? Just wait. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, what's your advice to people wanting to go on the show next year? Because there's going to be a record number of applicants, I'm sure, for next year off the back of the success of this year. Um... Of how to get on or what? I don't just <laughs> sort of dealing with the whole oh, thing. Oh, dealing with it. Just have fun, man. Don't expect, don't, just just be yourself. Just have fun. Because I find it's one of them places where if you don't be yourself, you'll get caught out in 10 seconds. Um, you'll be stressed. It, it, you know, it's such an amazing experience in there. It's, you know, that, that's all I can really say. Just don't don't overdo anything. Just just go in there, chill out, relax, have fun. It's it a lovely holiday at the end of the day, really, It is a lovely it? holiday. It's a stressful one, but it's, it's a lovely <laughs> one. That's what I mean. It's such an emotional roller coaster in there. That's why I say I think if you try and go in there and do too much, you try and go in there and have too much expectations for anything, or I think it will really chew you up and spit you out. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's a great experience. Um, if you do get on there, best of luck to you. And... Would you ever consider doing more reality telly, or is that kind of ticked off the list now? Mm, all depends on what it is. Um, I love stuff like Bear Grylls, the island, and stuff like that. So, um, so the ch like the challenges and stuff, yeah. But in terms of like another, I can see you on Strictly, Jamie. I'm not going to lie. I'm an awful dancer. <laughs> <laughs> you can see me on there for a bit of a bit of banter, I guess. <laughs> but, um, yeah, possibly. You know, like I say, I wouldn't rule anything out. It's just uh, at the moment I've got my focus on, on other things. But uh, Well, I know we've got loads of questions from the audience, so uh, we're going to go over to them now. So who has got the first one? Hello. Hi. Um, is there any, like, funny moments that happened on Love Island that didn't make it onto the TV? Yeah, quite a few. Um, it's annoying, actually, because when I came out and watched them back, I was like, damn it, I didn't get on there. <laughs> there was a... One of the biggest sing-alongs I think I've ever had with me, Marcel, Chris, Kem, and Alex, and we were all standing on one bed each, belting out Oasis songs for about an hour and a half, which was <laughs> incredibly fun. But then I realised they're not allowed to put any like um, you have to get clearance licensed and all that songs kind of, yeah. and stuff on. So we were all, I think we were all singing twice as hard because we thought this is definitely gonna make it on TV. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a little competition, but it didn't. But yeah, that was probably one of my best. Um, Best memories from the lads. 
No. But we saw you on the piano and stuff, so we know that you're pretty musical, so... Piano? Were you on the... Or was it the guitar you guitar, were on? Guitar, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I can play a few chords, I guess. So, hey, musical collaboration with Chris and Kem could be up. They're yeah, now chart, there chart stars, so there we yeah. go. Uh, who's got the next question? Hello. Hi. Um, what... Um, sorry. <laughs> what um, one um, thing that you do at the gym that you hate? One thing that I do at the gym that I hate? Yeah. Turning up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, I used to do a lot of weight training, which I despise, but now all I do is boxing at the gym, which I love. So, um, yeah, as long as I'm there to box and I enjoy myself. Um, I did used to like running, but I'm not so keen on that anymore. So, but yeah, before that, just weights. I just can't, I can't do weights anymore. That's probably why I'm getting skinny. But it's all about finding that thing you enjoy, isn't it? I'm saying that like I'm some ripped Adonis, which is not <laughs> true. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. I mean, it, after training for a little while, it just becomes a bit of a chore. So if you find something in the gym that you do enjoy, stick to that. Yeah, yeah. good advice. Uh, who is next? Hello. Hi. You're always being compared to David Gandhi. So what one sport or skill do you think you could beat him at? Boxing. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on, Gandhi. <laughs> I he's think you'd have a lot a of people. Lad, actually, yeah. So you'd have a lot of people pay to see that. I think you and David yeah, Gandhi in the ring. Interesting concept. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh well, Sally, I think that's all we've got time for, Jamie. But it's been so lo lovely having you here with us. Uh, if you want to catch Jamie's TEDx talk, um, you can get tickets online, right? Yeah, I think so. There we go. It's <laughs> on the 28th of October at Royal Holloway. Check it out. Uh, in the meantime, please give it up for Jamie Jewett, everyone. Thank you.